tonight. Minister of Justice Abubakar Malami says suspended commander of the police intelligence response team, Abakiari, has not been cleared of the $1.1 million money laundering allegation. No religious dispute between President Mahmoud Buhari and I for seven years. Vice President Professor Yami Oshibajo says as he urges religious leaders to use faith to promote peace. Governor Darius Ishako accuses traditional rulers in Taraba state of aiding fleeing bandits into the state. And Russian troops launched multiple air raids on a large Ukrainian military facility near the Polish border as it intensifies attacks. Suspended commander of the police intelligence response team and deputy commissioner of police, Abakiari, is not off the hook yet. And the $1.1 million money laundering allegation involving him and Ramon Abbas, popularly called Hush Puppy. And that's according to the country's attorney general and minister of justice, Abubakar Malami. The AGF says, uh, who was reacting to reports, he exonerated Mr. Kiari, says illegal advice by his office recommended further investigation of the suspended cop. According to a statement by his media aide, media reports about a contradiction in the minister's stance on the matter shows a misunderstanding and misconception of the issue as his ministry's stance is that no conclusion has been reached in the direction of absence of evidence relating to the first report. The statement further states that the issues were raised for further investigation with a view to covering the field in investigation and arriving at an informed decision. The first report from the office of the AGF to the Inspector General of Police had stated that the evidence contained in the case diary had no link between Abakiari and Hoshpapi in the $1.1 million internet fraud. The AGF, however, admitted that there were prima facie evidence against Kiari, adding that extradition moves are ongoing in the matter. Vice President Yami Oshibajo says he and his principal, President Mahmoud Buhari, have enjoyed a good working relationship with no religious dispute between them. The Vice President buttresses his admission on religious tolerance when he received the Senegal Bay's Grand Khalifa of Tijaniya movement, His Eminence Sheikh Mohamedou Mahi Ibrahim Nias, on a curtsy visit at the presidential villa. According to the Vice President, President Mahmoud Buhari is a serious Muslim and I'm a pastor. Both of us have worked together for about seven years. We have not had any issues. He urges leaders of faith to close ranks for the purpose of using religious, a religion to address emergent challenges in society, saying, with what is going on across the world, people of faith must continue to emphasize that both major religions, Islam and Christianity, promote peace and we must allow our people to practice whatever religion they want to practice. The Vice President also urges religious leaders to use faith to promote peace and show prosperity for the people as well as development of society. Zoning of party, political parties and elected positions remains a controversial issue for both of Nigeria's main political parties, but aligned majority interests will resolve it. That's according to the chairman of the Northern Governors Forum and Governor of Plateau State, Samuel Along. He told Channel's Television's Ladi Akredulali on our current affairs program, Newsnight, that the All Progressives Congress and the People's Democratic Party are still grappling with zoning, but that because, in his view, politics is a beautiful game, the citizens are likely to be surprised in the end. Well, politics is a matter, is a, is a, is a discussion about, uh, I will say, about interests. It is very obvious that you have a lot of people coming together with different interests. At the end of the day, what you do is that majority interests will really flow and carry the day. Now, even as it is, yes, some governors are saying they don't want Tony. They are contesting for election, not only in APC. There, is, there are also some in PDP who are saying it's the same issue. Honestly, that is why politics is a beautiful game. That's why I would say that in politics, where you see thunderstorm and you believe that it is going to rain, 
It's possible if they sit down, it will stop that rain. <laughs> There's a way they will stop the rain. So I think for me, I enjoy it when there is that, thund- that kind of thunderstorm. It brings out the best politically. I've seen people who are saying, we don't want zoning. I don't want zoning. Okay, bring what you think that will make you not to do zoning. Bring your capacity that will influence people not to agree to, uh, uh, to, agree to, to zoning. Now we are in the process. We have not reached conclusion. If it was something that APC alone was doing, you would say, ah, it is this APC. They are did again. But all the parties, nobody is judging. Nobody is putting any conclusion as to what will happen. In PDP today, nobody can tell you that this is the direction. So the same thing. So you also keep uh, part of beauty of game of politics is to, is to keep people guessing. It's to put, keep people guessing. At the end of the day, there will be a smooth arrangement. And everybody will just be very happy with it. You can watch the full interview with Governor Lelong on Newsnight as tomorrow, Monday, March 14th, 2022, at 9 p.m. right here on Channels Television. Staying with politics, minority ethnic groups in Benue South Senatorial District have lamented the failure of the National Assembly to pass the rotational governorship and presidential bill to allow every zone in an estate produce a governor. The group under the umbrella, the Rebirth Movement, staged a protest at the government house in Makwadi, the Benue State Capital, asking that the governor support the call for Benue South to produce the next governor of the state. Youth, women groups and residents throng the streets of Makodi, the Benue state capital, to rally against what they describe as marginalization in the governorship position since 1976. They are mostly from Benue South, comprising Idoma, Igede, Akweya and Ufia. They march through Amadubelo Way down to the government house in Makodi, where they present a letter to the state governor to cede the position of governor to Benue South come 2023. All we are saying, all we are basing on today is all about equity, justice and fairness. And we know His Excellency, the governor of Benue State, is a man who believes in that three course. Responding Governor Tom, who is represented by his deputy, asks the group to continue lobbying to press on their requests. Since uh, Benway State was founded 46 years plus ago, nobody from that zone C axis has ever been governor. The people must consult widely. They must talk to all the segments of the society of Benway. They must talk to traditional rulers and they must also discuss with the political class. Another rally holds at the IBB Square, Makodi, where a federal commissioner from the National Population Commission and former deputy governor of the state lend their voices to the calls for the governorship ticket to be rotated among the various ethnic groups in the state. Every child that keeps coming second, 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 will never be satisfied until he moves to occupy that first position. And this thing is doable. And we're adding all our voices to say peace. 2023, we have an array of children, sons and daughters, fit for number one position in this state. If after 46 years, people have not seen it wise and right for a part of the state to produce the governor of Benue State. Some indigents of Benue State believe that the time has come for the governorship seat to be rotated among other ethnic groups, particularly in Benue South, for fairness and equity. The year 2023 represents another opportunity for political parties in Nigeria to test their popularity as the country goes into another general election. Expertly, political parties are gearing up for the contest and the battle of who controls what within the party structures taking centre stage in most of the political parties, not ignoring the fact that the 2023 elections will be conducted with a new electoral law. Our next report takes a look at the intrigues and the leadership of political parties ahead of the 2023 general elections. 
It is a pre-election year in Nigeria, and activities in the political space are getting heated up. Civil society groups have pressured the country's leadership to amend the Electoral Act with the hope that it can deliver a credible process in 2023. The political parties are gearing up for the battle in 2023, but first, the issue of internal party control is vital for the politicians. Candidates in Nigeria's elections are nominated by political parties, and this explains the shovings, which often leads to disaffection among party faithful in the quest to elect principal officers. Often, such acrimony has led to the unceremonious exit of party chairman. When you talk about party, it's the, it's the national working committees, both at the local, the state, and the national level. There are people who are cash cows or who are money bags, who their interest is to control those structures because it is the structure itself that makes up this political party. That's why sometimes even an unpopular candidate emerge. Once the interest of the structure or the owners of the political party is in line with that a candidate or aspirant, even if he's not popular, even if he or she does not have a manifesto, they would deliver victory to that particular person. Nobody runs election in Nigeria as an independent. So the, who controls the party levers, party leadership structure, is already putting himself or herself in a poor position to win the spoils of this electoral war. And that's why there is a lot of leadership struggle about who controls the party machinery. Because they are the ones that, uh, that will create or establish the committees that will go and conduct the primary. They have much influence. Experience has shown that no political party is immune to these intrigues. For instance, a struggle for party leadership led to the unceremonious exit of the PDP national chairman, Prince Uche Secondus, who challenged his removal in the court. The ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, is also emerged in a leadership crisis. First, it was the former national chairman, Mr. Adams Oshomali, who exited office unceremoniously. The caretaker committee that replaced him is facing a leadership crisis of its own as it prepares for a national convention. In APC alone, arising from uh, the party congresses convention that is being shifted here and there, there are already 208 litigations. There's, there's leadership vacuum at the political party. Today, the two major political parties, there are a lot of vacuum. There's power tussle. You know, there's a lot of disagreement. I also believe that there's opportunity for emerging politicians. However, the electoral umpire warns against any action that contravenes the electoral act ahead of the 2023 general elections. Whatever a political party wants to do, uh, whatever intrigue there are in a political party, and whatever challenges they have, they must pay attention uh, to the dictates of the law, to the provisions of the Electoral Act uh, in whatever they do. Because if they don't, there's a possibility that they may not have a candidate in, 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 um, in, during the 2023 uh, general election. As the preparation for the 2023 general elections get intense, these intrigues will definitely shape the form of the political party and indeed the political space. It is hoped that it will be in the interest of all Nigerians. In part two after the break, National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, arrests the general overseer of a church with 54 sticks of cannabis wrapped around his body. Who join us again? Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channels television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Minister of Justice Abubakar Malami says suspended commander of the police intelligence response team, Abba Kiari, has not been cleared of the $1.1 million money laundering allegation. No religious dispute between President Mahmoud Buhari and I for seven years. Vice President Professor Yemil Shibajo says as he urges religious leaders to use faith to promote peace. Governor Darius Ishako accuses traditional rulers in Taraba state of aiding fleeing bandits into the state.
and Russian troops launched multiple air raids on a large Ukrainian military facility near the Polish border as it intensifies attacks. Nigerian students who were seen in a viral video last week asking the federal government to get them out of Ukraine are now back in the country. The students, numbering about 300 fleeing from the crisis in Ukraine, have been successfully evacuated by the federal government. They arrived home and board an Air Asman flight from Budapest, Hungary on Saturday night. Another batch of Nigerian evacuees from Ukraine arrive at the Nnamdi Azikiwe International Airport Abuja on Saturday. The Asman flight arrived at about 8.40 p.m. These batch of returnees are mostly stranded students in Sumi who had asked the federal government to rescue them amidst attack by Russian invaders. Inside the hall, they are documented. They also undergo COVID-19 testing. Some of them share their experiences while in Ukraine. A couple of weeks ago, they came to give us an information that they want to cut off the light from Russia. So we said, okay, no problem, that we are fully prepared. But very early on Thursday, around 5 a.m., we had the missile being shot at our military barrack, which is almost direct opposite our school. So we were asked to move to the bunker. From there, we start living our life under the bunker. So we only have maybe like 30 minutes of ourselves. We cannot cook, we cannot eat. We sleep in the bunker, everything under the bunker. I feel very happy and safe because honestly, the situation back in Sumi especially wasn't funny at all. We were so scared because we were stuck and then coming back now, we feel very happy. They are received by a delegation from the government led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Each of the evacuees is handed 100 United States dollars and a SIM card to facilitate their communication. We have capacity to go for more than uh, what we have done now. In fact, we have not gone halfway from our projection. So, but one thing you must also know is that there are a lot that are coming through commercial flights. And uh, we are paying. And sometimes when you have... 5, 10, 20, you can't send a whole jumbo jet to go and carry those people. So for such number, we organize one-way ticket for each of them. And they are arriving in their numbers. As they complete the necessary processes, they are released to their family members who did not hide their joy as they received them. To security, at least five passengers have been killed, three others injured after terrorists and their numbers opened fire on a vehicle traveling along Yantumaki Damusa Road in Damusa local government area of Katsina State. Eyewitnesses told Channel Television that out of the eight passengers who were all indigents of the state, six of them were coming from Benin City in Edo State and one was coming back from the Federal Capital Territory as well as the driver. He said the vehicle left Yantumaki for Damusa town in the early hours of Saturday. Damusa is one of the most vulnerable areas in Katsina State, sharing boundaries with the dreaded Rugu forests in areas like Safana, Kankara and other communities in Zamfara State, where bandits are very active. Taraba State Governor Darius Ishaku is blaming traditional rulers for the influx of bandits fleeing the onslaught of the military in Sokoto, Kaduna and Zamfara states into Taraba. According to him, traditional rulers are collecting bribes to allow the bandits settled, settle in their communities. He was speaking during a prayer session in Takum local government area, seeking divine intervention on ending insecurity in the state. Taraba State has been witnessing an influx of bandits fleeing military onslaught in states like Zamfara, Sokoto and Kaduna. At this prayer session to seek spiritual intervention for the security concerns of the state, Governor Darius Ishaku reveals that traditional rulers from the state should be held responsible for insecurity in the state. And the people to blame our uh, traditional rulers. And the people in encouraging and accepting them. About this, about this in the tomb of the soap and bend and it's a big one. How can I make you a traditional ruler to look after my people and you are there taking some money to keep bandage with you? I refuse it. 
Naishahu appeals to residents of Taraba State to live in peace with one another. However, some residents are asking the governor to solve the infrastructure needs of the communities. Your Excellency, I am so happy to be here. 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 Your Excellency, Jamanka, Daga Usa local government, Hardua Bangarin, Kurimi, Sumubi Tozozoa Bisola, Nang Yafi Stories, Zori, Masuna Jira, Chiwa, Sumba, the Gaskia, Kamika, so Kaza, Shamaganiana. Architect Darius Dixon, the Shaku. At a separate event, Governor Ishaku seeks the cooperation of residents for a peaceful transition in 2023. We are praying that now we are going into another new dispensation of politicking by 2022 to 2023. We pray that you pray along with us so that we will be able to bring a new set. So, particularly now that our tenor is finished. Residents of Taraba State expect the state government, having identified the reasons for the influx of bandits into the state, will henceforth come up with more drastic measures to tackle the problem once and for all. Staying with security, 559 repentant ex Boko Haram members have undergone a de radicalization, rehabilitation, and reintegration program of the federal government's Operation Safe Corridor Command, aimed at using non kinetic means of tackling insurgency in the northeast of Nigeria. It's the fifth batch of individuals who have undergone the exercise since 2017. According to officials of Operation Safe Corridor, these individuals have participated in a series of programs which have changed their orientation from being terrorists to rebuilding their communities. The program, as you all know, is initiative of the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, President Muhammadu Buhari, with its sole aim of encouraging willing and repentant Boko Haram members to lay down their arms and go through a structured DDR, DDR program. The DDR program consists of series of psychological, psychosocial, psychospiritual therapies, as well as vocational training, which provides viable alternative to low profile combatants. From inception in 2015 to date, over 1,000 clients have been processed through Operation Safe Corridor with about 984, including 16 foreign nationals, successfully reintegrated to their national and state governments. This morning, we are witnessing the graduation of another set of 559 clients who will be integrated, integrated into society as soon as possible. Let me, at this point, urge the graduate clients to appreciate and reciprocate the confidence reposed in you as worthy beneficiaries of our DDR program. As you return to your communities for the reintegration phase, I urge you all to brace up for the challenges ahead. Officers of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, have arrested the General Overseer of Christ Living Hope Church with 54 sticks of drugs wrapped around his body, which tested positive for cannabis at the Muslim Mohammed International Airport in Ikeja, en route Nairobi, Kenya. Another passenger arriving from Sao Paulo via Addis Ababa with 40 parcels of 9.70 kilograms of cocaine concealed in body cream bottles was intercepted during inward clearance at the airport. In another successful outing by operators of the NDLEA, a freight agent was arrested at the NACO export shed with a cargo containing 19.15 kilograms of cannabis going to London concealed in a plastic container labeled African dishes packed in a bag. A 63-year-old man was also arrested with 350 grams of cocaine and 150 grams of heroin concealed in industrial torch packets heading to Kano around the Apapa seaport. 
Meanwhile, in a follow-up operation at Central Market Kaduna, a total of 1,959 bottles of codeine were recovered from one James Okenwa, who claimed ownership of the commodities amongst other successes recorded by the agency. As Nigerians continue queuing up for premium motor spirits for high costs at filling stations across the country, the Nigerian Customs Service says over 70,000 litres of the product have been seized in the southwest zone. The acting controller of Customs Federal Operations Unit, Zone A, Hussein Ejibunu, told journalists that about 36,000 litres were impounded in Lagos Axis alone. It's been a difficult experience for Nigerians in the last one month, following the scarcity of premium motor spirit PMS across the country, causing long queues and traffic congestion. Authority of the Nigerian Customs Service says one of the factors responsible for the situation are the activities of daredevil smugglers who smuggle products in large quantity across the nation's border. To check these leakages, the anti-smuggling operation across the western zone has intercepted about 35,400 liters of PMS stored in drums and kegs in the Oyo Axis, while the Federal Operations Unit Zone A impounded over 36,000 liters of same product along the Lagos border. Just a few days ago, we brought in almost about 1,134 kegs at once. And we are from where? At Igbo Iberu. It's in between Iwoye that connects Oyo. So they will load from Iwoye, Ogun. Then link up that place. Last five minutes drive, you're already in, in, uh, in French land. The government, they have actually tried. And we are making effort to ensure that we want to establish a unit solely responsible for smuggling of oil. Elsewhere, citing this haulage truck, one will presume that its contents are just bags of cement, but closer examination shows it contains a large amount of imported parboiled rice. This haulage truck was intercepted along Dangote Road at Ibishi, conveying over 400 bags of foreign parboiled rice in 50 kg. This oldest truck as it stands, the rice and the haulage as the means of conveyance will automatically be seized. The service, however, assures that it will not rest on its oars as credible intelligence shows these activities has direct links to illicit drug trafficking, proliferation of firearms, and other criminal activities. Still on the news at 10, Imo State and the federal government are launching integrated farm estates to create jobs and ensure food security. That's in a moment. Do join us again. Welcome back. There's need to break away from issues of gender discrimination poverty and low self-esteem among young women. That's according to the Delta State Governor Ifai Okowa, who reiterated this in his who, reiterate, who reiterated his administration's passion for the girl child empowerment during the graduation of beneficiaries of the 2021 to 2022 Girls Entrepreneurship and Skills Training Program in the state capital. The girl child empowerment was designed essentially to uplift the economic and social status of traditionally underprivileged girls aged 18 to 30 in the state. Six months ago, the second cycle of trainees under the Girls Entrepreneurship and Skills Training Program began undergoing training in various skills. Over 800 of them are being ushered into the world of business and entrepreneurship with Our Governor Fanyo Okoa, his wife Dame Edith Okoa, and other government functionaries present to witness the formal handover of starter packs to the beneficiaries. As the second circle of Project Jazz beneficiaries... In her welcome address, the Senior Special Assistant to the Governor on Girl Child Empowerment, Mrs. Marilyn Okoa Daramola, narrates how the second cycle, known as the Magnificent 900, scaled through the process of training till the end. Out of the 900 selected candidates, I present to you 
814 passionate, powerful, dedicated, and ambitious women from across our great state Delta, who stuck through the process, maintained their focus, and are here today crossing the finish line. Special Guest of Honor and Chief Executive Officer, House of Tara, Mrs. Tara Feladrotoy, urged the beneficiaries to build their businesses by leaving a lasting impression in the minds of their customers. I want you to go ahead and build your business so that it will last for a hundred years and beyond. Today you, you can still recall, remember the brand House of Tara. I still have a long way to go, but it's also a symbol for you that you can build a business that can outlive you that can start 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and over and over again. Those who distinguished themselves during the training were also recognized and rewarded uh, with awards and cash gifts. The package that will be given to you to commence. The governor speaks on the gains of the Girl Child Program. This is in tandem with the philosophy of JEST, which is to tackle the issue of gender discrimination, poverty, early and forced marriage, identity crisis, social and parental pressure, poor life skills, and low self-esteem among our women. The ceremony also featured presentation of starter bags to the graduates. Those from the second cycle were trained in 10 skill areas, including photography, videography, ICT, website development and graphics design, baking and confectionaries, leather works, professional cleaning services, and even disc jockeying. Out of the 900 selected candidates, 814 beneficiaries across the state scaled through to the graduation. While the duration of training for 70 other beneficiaries is currently being extended to further assess their knowledge in their chosen skills. And in Imo State, the federal government, in partnership with the state, has inaugurated the newly rehabilitated integrated livestock farm, popularly called Acharobo Farm Estate, located at Acharobo Community in a very north local government area of the state. According to President Mamadou Buhari, who was represented by the Imo State Governor, Hopu Zodimma, the reactivation of the farm is part of the Buhari administration's vision of providing food security and modern livestock production for people of Imo State and the entire Southeast. Sitting on a landmass of over 35 hectares, the Acharaobo Farm Estate in a very north local government area of Imo State, which has been abandoned for over 30 years, has now been renovated by the federal government through National Agricultural Land Development Authority, NALDA, and is now set for commissioning. President Mohamed Buhari, represented by Governor Hopu Zodima, in company of other top officials and the people of the area, witnessed its inauguration. The State Commissioner for Livestock Development gives an account of the present state of the farm, while the Executive Secretary of NALDA notes that the farm will create jobs for the youth in the area. The farm should be able to pay or continue the empowerment of the youth employed in it. We intend to achieve this by expanding our activities in the farm through the establishment of facilities that will help us introduce businesses that will sustain the project. With this project, the community will experience traffic because this farm is expected to be productive not only to feed the community, the state, and the laboring state. The state lawmaker representing Uweri North promises that the community will protect the facility. We are going to provide security, local security and hospitality for this project. Governor Hopu Zodima says this development is a testimony to the cordial relationship between the state and federal government, which has a direct impact on addressing the needs of the people. Today marks another milestone. In our strategic drive to partner with the federal government, I beg the villagers, please, see this farm as your own. The community, you are the landlord. The project is your project. Whatever benefit that will come out of this project, you will be considered first before any other person will be considered. I do this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The Echara Opo Integrated Farm Estate presently has six poultry houses with 18 pens that contain about 15,000 birds, three goat houses with 196 goats and three piggeries containing 108 pigs. About 200 farmers drawn from Imo State are also set to commence a six-month training on various sectors of farming. Well, staying with infrastructure, the Federal Ministry of Works says it has rehabilitated and overlain six asphalt roads across some tertiary institutions, communities and other major roads linking Potiskum Kano and Potiskum Bochi highways in Yobe State. The field engineer, Federal Road Maintenance Agency in Yobe State, Engineer Abba Baba, disclosed this while inspecting some major road projects in the state. This is Mufakalam, a satellite community in Damaturu, the Yobe state capital, which has economic potentials but lacks good roads to transport farm produce. Federal Polytechnic Damaturu is also not left out of the poor road network with commuters experiencing greater challenges during the rainy season. <laughs> Four or five years ago, if you come to this institution, honestly, you, you will pity us. More especially during the rainy season. Students and staff found it very difficult to walk around. As a result of that, I approached PEMA, that's Federal Road Maintenance Agency. Good news has however come the way of the communities as Federal Road Maintenance Agency is at the verge of completing the Potiskum Kano Road, Potiskum Bochi Road overlaying of asphalt along Damaturu Mufakalam, as well as internal roads rehabilitation and drainage at Federal Polytechnic Damaturu. This road is Potiskum Bypass Road. It's a spur to two federal roads. It's a spur to Potiskum as the Rekano State Border Road. It is also a spur to uh, Potiskum Kari Bauchi State Border Road. It's a very important road. It is in a built-up area and connecting to two federal roads. According to FEMA field engineer, the effort is aimed at easing movement of goods, reduce accidents, as well as provide a conducive learning environment for students of the tertiary institutions. These beneficiaries appreciate the federal government for coming to their aid after about 20 years of battling with poor roads. As the rains approach, the residents look forward to the rehabilitation of more roads in the state in order to boost its economy. The Kaduna State Government has commenced payment of death benefits and gratuity to deceased and retired civil servants amounted to 1.2 billion naira. The payment, which is under the Group Life Insurance Sinking Fund, covers for all state and local government employees who died in active service. Speaking at the presentation of checks to families of deceased civil servants, the Deputy Governor of Kaduna State, Dr. Hadiza Balarabe, said apart from the payment of death benefits, the state government has also initiated some programs and policies geared towards improving welfare of civil servants in Kaduna. Apologies. Since its inception in 2015, the administration of Governor Nasser El Rufai of Kaduna State has initiated some policies to improve the welfare of civil servants in the state. One of such policies in the state civil service is clearing the backlog of arrears of gratuity of retirees and death benefits of those who died in active service. The Kaduna State Deputy Governor, Dr. Adiza Balarabi, hands over checks to families of civil servants who died in active service under the Kaduna State Group Life Insurance Sinking Fund. We're also putting in place so many um, reforms and policies to help our workers. As we always say, um, your salary should not be the only thing that you should depend on. I think one of the reasons why we have declared um, 
uh, four day work week is also to give that time on Friday for people to engage in other lawful uh, businesses. So we will always try as much as possible to do all within our power to make sure that we keep our workers safe and we make their families comfortable in the event that we lose them. The sinking fund covers all employees of the Kaduna State Civil Service, but according to the Executive Secretary of State Pension Bureau, only those who died in active service are entitled to benefit from it. This, she says, is to cushion the suffering of the families of the deceased who are affected by the death of their breadwinners. This is the first beneficiary on the sinking fund. We've had beneficiary of the previous group life insurance, but for the uh, sinking fund that we, we took as alternative to approach to the group life insurance, this is the first. On behalf of my family and other beneficiaries, we say thank you to this gesture, to the, to the Kaduna City Government and Nigeria as whole. The Kaduna state government also reviewed the pension law in 2016, establishing the contributory pension scheme and other retirement plans, including the group life insurance sinking fund. Although some of these programs' efforts have been beset by several challenges, the state government says it will continue to find ways of addressing them to get better outcomes. And now to the arts. Landscapes and Beyond, a salon of paintings, is an exhibition at My Dream Gallery, Lagos. It features images that span between 2009 and 2020 by landscape painters Joseph Ayelero and Olua Femi Otoki. On our review tonight, we see these key periods for these artists since the beginning of their full-time studio practice. The works of art displayed in Dialogue, a solo exhibition by Akachuku Chukuemeka, shows his new style and technique, a collection of his reflections over the years. It's like my personal reflections. It's like my notes, my diary notes. So I try to bring it out for people to look at it in colors. That's why you say dialogue, artist personal reflections in colors. About 20 paintings contain different stories the artist is fascinated about. He carefully captures them on each tie and dyed canvas and they are connected as well. Each one is a complete sto short story but at the same time each one is linked to the other one. You know, it's like the story of the society where an individual story does not make the story of the society. You have to collectively bring everybody's story and put them together to make a complete story. So that's what we're doing here. And each, show, well, each piece of work is like a short story, a short story linked to another story, which makes a complete story. So I try to capture my personal reflection about the society, about me, my experiences, and other people's experiences. From this collection, it has over 800 of these pieces. He's been working on it since 2013. That's over eight years now. And it's just basically his perspective of observing the sky. So he's using cloud formations to kind of tell a story of things that he's experiencing currently in society from his background. So it's like a personal journal for him. This is like a diary. He's illustrating things that he has experienced from religious background as well as, as friendships down to the very society that we live in. So each of these pieces tells a story about that. He takes time to explain some of the exhibits. The message that lies within has a lot to do with African literature. If you look at the one titled Grief, the one right here, Grief, it shows what people pass through, you know. When you lose someone, it's called that sometimes you cannot say how you react when you lose someone. When they tell you, oh, this person is dead, you may not expect you may not even know how you react. It's people around who are the people that can tell you, look at how you react. Some even may want to jump into the river. Some will want to jump, in, jump into the grave. They will lose control of everything. So I try to capture, having experienced loss of loved ones, I try to have an introspection. Grief, what does it mean? How does it come out? How do you conquer grief? So I have to put it to creativity. 
This need to give a visual appeal to interesting African tales through amazing art is part of the artist's Forms for My Sky series, which is painting the continent with color. our shores now russia claims its missile attack on the yavorov training facility in western ukraine killed up to 180 foreign mercenaries and destroyed a large amount of weapons supplied by outside nations the first ministry spokesman igor konashenkov told a briefing today that russia would continue its attacks against foreign fighters joining ukrainian forces Earlier today, Ukraine's regional governor, Maxim Korzykskaya, said 35 people were killed and 134 wounded in the attack. Russian airstrike on a large Ukrainian military facility near the border with NATO member Poland on Sunday killed 35 people and wounded 134 as local officials report intense Russian attacks around the country. The incident, just 15 miles from the Polish border, marks a significant escalation of the conflict, especially because of its close proximity to Poland, a NATO member. Polish President Andrzej Duda, in an interview on Sunday, said that the use of chemical weapons in Ukraine by Russia would be a game changer and NATO would have to think seriously about how to respond. Well, of course, everybody hopes that he will not dare do that, that he will not use weapons of mass destruction, neither chemical weapons, nor biological weapons, or, nor any form of nuclear weapons. Everybody is hoping that this is not going to happen. U.S. President Joe Biden had said NATO would defend every inch of its territory if Russia's invasion of Ukraine spills into member states of the Western Defense Alliance. Civilians who are caught up in this conflict have been trying to escape the city of Irpin on Sunday as Russian airstrikes hit the city. Soldiers and volunteers helped elderly people and children to cross over the river and walk as roads and bridges throughout the northern town are destroyed or severely damaged. My mom, she doesn't move and uh, that's why it's uh, a more complicated task to, to get them off. Over in the eastern Ukrainian town of Volnovokar, the region has been completely destroyed following the Russian invasion, but fighting continues for territory there to prevent a Russian encirclement. Donetsk governor Pavlo Krylenko made this known on Saturday. Volnovokar was reported to be in control of pro-Russian separatists, with sporadic fights on the outskirts emerging until recently. The infrastructure in the town is heavily damaged or destroyed. In the meantime, President Vladimir Zelensky, in a video address on Sunday, has announced that nearly 125,000 people have been evacuated via humanitarian corridors from conflict zones in Ukraine. This comes as more humanitarian aid for the besieged city of Maripol is expected to arrive after being held up overnight in Berdyansk. Ukrainian police say U.S. journalist Brent Renault has been shot dead in the town of Irping, outside Kyiv. Kyiv's police chief Andrei Nebitov says he had been targeted by Russian soldiers. Two others were wounded and taken to hospital. Meanwhile, journalists have been banned from entering the town of Irpin or near Kyiv following Renault's death. Irpin's mayor, Oleksandr Mashukshin, gave the order on Telegram. He also urged reporters and Ukrainian civilians not to post information online about military personnel, their equipment or anything that could indicate their location.
former U.S. President Barack Obama says he has tested positive for the coronavirus, though he's feeling relatively healthy, and his wife, Michelle, tested negative. Mr. Obama said on Twitter today, I've had a scratchy throat for a couple of days, but I'm feeling fine otherwise. Michelle and I are grateful to be vaccinated and boosted. Obama is encouraging more Americans to get vaccinated against the coronavirus, despite the declining infection rate in the U.S. In sports news, the Beijing 2022 Winter Paralympics has ended with a closing ceremony at the National Stadium in the Chinese capital that carried the message of love after games that began with political chaos. Russian and Belarusian athletes were barred from competing by International Paralympic Committee on the eve of the games following threats of boycotts by other teams over Ukraine's, beg upon in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine, however, ended their campaign second on the medals table with a total of 29. Host China topped the medal standings with 18 gold and their overall tally of 61. In his closing remarks, IPC President Andrew Parsons hoped that the Paralympian movement would inspire world leaders to unite. Back home, Rivers United have extended their lead at the top of the Nigeria Professional Football League after forcing their host, Gombe United, to a goalless draw at the Pantami Stadium earlier today. Stanley Guma's side topped the log with 39 points from 18 games. And in Loring, the Quarry United kept pace with the front runners after a hard 4 2 1 win against Heartland. At the Otumba Dipo Dino Stadium, Ijebode Sunshine Stars rallied back from a goal down to beat Dakada 2 1. Katsina United beat Wiki Tourists 1 0. Reigning champions Aqua United lost 3 0 to Enugu Rangers in Uyo, while Nasara United and MFM played out a 1 0 draw in another match day 18 encounter in Lafia. In the EPL, Kai Havertz struck late to seal Chelsea a late 1-0 win against a Brazilian Newcastle side in the Premier League at Stamford Bridge earlier today. Everton slipped further into danger as Wolves inflicted a fourth successive defeat on Frank Lampard's side with a hard-fought win at Goodison Park. Leeds landed a first victory under manager Jesse Marsh in stunning fashion as Joe Gilhart struck in injury time to beat relegation rivals Norwich. And the main news again, the Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, today said he has not exonerated suspended commander of the police intelligence response team, Abba Kiari, from the $1.1 million money laundering allegation leveled against him by the FBI. That's it on the news of Ted tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Good night.